So when you go about decisions, ask yourself, am I asking from wise people? And who am I paying attention to when it comes to making a crucial decision in your life? And here's the worst part. Lots of times people think, I make a decision when I'm high or low. Never make a decision when you're down, because that's your fear talking to you. But when you're down, guess what you listen to? The words of the wise. The actions and the behaviors of the wise, not the hasty. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And in this episode of the Wealth and Wisdom series, we're unpacking chapter 22, Proverbs 22, from King Solomon, who actually wrote entire Proverbs in the Bible. And we're going to talk about a few things that he leaves in gems and dimes and nuggets. He leaves in this chapter about how to go about money, how to lead yourself through decisions, how to lead yourself with your family and raising your children. And so I'm excited about this because there's so many things that I've always thought about money. There's so many ways I've thought about going about business and how I thought about how I present myself to the marketplace, how I lead my family. So let's break it down. I broke down chapter 22 here with just 10 of them. By the way, there's so many different lessons in chapter 22, which by the way, there's so many lessons about money in all of Proverbs. Why? Because King Solomon is regarded as the wisest and richest king who ever lived. Which by the way, I encourage you to pick up the Bible not to shove Jesus down your throat, not to shove God down your throat, but see how these scriptures, how these Proverbs give you thoughts and ideas how to go about life. Because sometimes we think about, hmm, I'm just gonna go about life. I'm just gonna go about my money. I'm just gonna go about writing my business, leading my career, just being a good person. Which by the way, it's a great intention. However, what is that good person based on? What's the value? What's the moral? What's the principle it's based on? Because if it's not based and anchored on something, and it's not anchored on something, guess what? You're gonna go about life, you're gonna go about leading a career over the years, and that anchor, if it's not anchored, it's just gonna pick up and move with the rocky storms that you're about to go through. Not just the good times, but how you go about making decisions in the bad times, that's what separates, in my opinion, the difference between a good leader and a bad leader. So let's take a look at this. In his first category here, I put Proverbs here as it relates to what he says about reputation, behaviors, and the foundation of wealth. Let's pick it up here. He talks about you having a good name. So some of you guys will be thinking, what the, it's assumed that I have a good name, but how do you know you have a good name? So how important is a good name? It's so important that even the credit companies, the credit scores, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, they care about you having a good name, that you pay your bills on time. How important is it? Even King Solomon is talking about how important having a good name is Let's take a look at what it says here in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1. It reads like this. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. Think about this. Outside of you just having a good credit score, when you walk into a room, do people notice that you're there for the right intentions, of course? That when you walk into a boardroom, people know, man, a leader shows up. When you walk to a bank, wow, a good customer is going to show up. When you walk into a deal, wow, a guy with a reputation to get things done the right way, the moral way, the ethical way, the legal way, what happens to that deal? What happens to that agreement? What happens to that conversation? Is it start on a high or does it start on a low? Are you working uphill throughout your life or are you working downhill throughout your life? Meaning that every conversation you have about wealth, about prosperity, about leading your family, about providing for your family, are you working uphill or downhill? Well, start with first your name. If that meant something to you and you wanna change that in your life, put it in the comment section below. I am building a good name. Put it in the comment section below. The second one here, talk about how to make decisions. So sometimes we make very, very, very emotional decisions or very logical decisions. What does King Solomon say? How to go about making your decisions. Proverbs chapter 22, verse three, it reads like this. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So let me define that word prudent for you. Prudent is defined like this, acting with or showing care and thought for the future. See, often we make decisions, especially about money, in the now. We're in the now moment. You know, a great oracle of Omaha, his name is Warren Buffett. His net worth today is well over 113 billion. And he owns a company called Berkshire Hathaway. And just one share is worth $403,000 just for one share of his company. And he's often asked, how come more people don't listen to you? How come more people uh, don't listen to you about crypto and technology and this and this and that? Why do more people listen to you? Because a lot of people aren't. Is the reason why is I teach people how to get rich slow. 
See, people today, they want to get involved in something, boom, get rich quick right away. They want to put $100 into something, boom, they want to be a millionaire right away. No, there's a way about going about wealth building and there's a way about going about leading your business and running your business is being prudent. Not just thinking for the short term, but for the long term. Okay, so when you are making decisions and you have a little bit of success, you have a little bit of cash in your pocket, you have a little bit of good decisions back to back to back, how should you go about making the next decision? How should you go about managing your finances? As it says here in Proverbs chapter 22, verse four, it reads like this. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So you wanna be a king or do you wanna be a king maker? What is your wealth? What are your plans? What are your aspirations all for? To glorify you? To put you on a pedestal? Or is it for you to bless other people? Is it for you to really help the community? And for those of you in the faith, is it for you to make your God known or more important for you to make your name known? Now, if you believe that's you and you wanna invoke that in your life, please put this affirmation in the comment section below. I'm hungry and humble. I am hungry and humble. Put it in the comment section below. Let's take a look at another value and principle we talked about here, about your children. So if that's about how you go about your life, what do you think your children are gonna pick up? It says here, train and lead your children this way. Proverbs chapter 22, verse six and 15, they read like this. Train a child up in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Okay, so on two fronts, it's about raising your child in the ways of the word. Let me go to this section here, because I used the John Maxwell Leadership Bible, and John talked about it and unpacked it even further, what does lead a child in the ways of the word mean? He talks about three things, modeling, management, and memories. Let me explain. Modeling, Abraham Lincoln said, there is but one way to train a child in the way he should go, and that is to travel it yourself. A good example is worth a thousand sermons. What you do has more impact on your child than all the lectures you could ever give. I've often said, your children don't necessarily listen to you, they just watch what you do. I believe that personal leadership, financial leadership, uh, go about leading your family, think about this, it's more caught than taught. How often, for those of you parents out there, have said, I'm never gonna be like my mom and dad, never gonna be that way. And then you have your own kids. And then yo, you do something that reminds you of what your mom and dad used to do to you. You don't realize you're doing it. It's like subconscious to you. Number two is management. Good management is the ability to discern the uniqueness of a child and teach him or her accordingly. Or to train up a child the way he should go. This may mean he will have to adapt our style depending on the child's temperament and wiring. And number three, memories. Parents should create memories. Why? Because memories are more important than things. Note that the verse says, when he is old, he will not depart. This implies that the child retains some memories of his early experiences and embraces them later in life. I've often heard that kids don't necessarily value your presence as in your gifts, but they value your presence as in your involvement in their life. One of the family traditions that my wife and I do, just like many families across America, is take your family on a vacation. And on these vacations, you create experiences. On these experiences, we find out lessons. By the way, check out this video right here of what my son said about his opinion on why we work so hard for our family. His answer would probably shock some of you who potentially may feel a little bit of a parent guilt because you have to work hard and build a life and a financial future for your family. So please check out this video. Okay, let's move on to the next one. What about making decisions? When you think about making decisions, who's really making those decisions? We've said in previous studies that there's somebody that's in control and somebody that's in charge. Which one are you? Let's read in Proverbs chapter 22, verse seven, it reads like this. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Yeah, there it is. Even in the Bible, even today, there's gonna to be rich people and poor people. And for those of you watching this video, you've got to decide which one you are. And by the way, let me give you this hint. Being rich or poor doesn't necessarily mean what's in your pocket or in your bank account. It's what is the condition of your spirit. Wealth and money starts there. So what's in your spirit? And for those of you looking out to extend credit and to borrow here and borrow there, well, it also says here too as well, the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, does that mean, Matt, I can't borrow? Does that mean I can't apply for credit? No, not at all. Because there's so many different religious organizations that would say, we're debt free, we're debt free, we're debt free. Why? Debt free, but are they really? Because if you look at the balance sheet, because all nonprofit 501c3 corporations have to file an annual report, disclose it to their contributors and their donors, it's a public knowledge, that you see on one column, there's liabilities. 
In the other column, there's assets. But yet they call themselves debt free, but they have liabilities. They have a loan, they have this. Wow. But at least in America, there's a benefit for leverage. There's a benefit for credit. But why do they say they're debt free? Well, because at any time they can take the money from the asset column, the liquid cash column, and pay off the debt in this column. So in other words, the lender is not in control of their decisions. They're not squeezing them for extra cash. So in other words, their assets still rule over the liabilities. So this is not a justification for you to go out and go borrow and we'll go borrow here and get credit here, credit here. There's a smart way to use credit and there's a poor way to use credit. And I know this is pretty controversial for a lot of people. A lot of people think, oh my gosh, credit cards are bad. Listen, I think credit cards are good. I think leverage is good. I think you having a bank in a banking relationship is very good. But sadly, the sin is when you use it to purchase things that you know you cannot pay back and to live a lifestyle that you know you cannot afford just to flex and just to look important among people that really aren't important at all. Because at the end of the day, remember, who's in control is in charge? God's in control. But in the meantime here on earth, you are in charge of making the best decision for you and your family, your business and career. Okay, let's go into this next section here. Wisdom follows these values and principles. So the first section we talk about reputation, behaviors, and a foundation of wealth. Let's talk about the next section here of the chapter of Proverbs about how wisdom follows these values and principles. It says here about listening. Incline your ear and attention to the words of who? The foolish? No, words of the wise. What's often easier to do is to follow the words of fools. You get trolled, people gossip, people get at you, people talk crap, you know what I'm talking about. But who should you really be listening to? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17, it reads this way. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. So if you didn't know this already, King Solomon is a young, young preteen boy. He was asked to rule the people of Israel. And God was asking him, what do you want, King Solomon? What do you want, King Solomon? You want army? You want more money? You want the queen? You want more land? You want more territory? You want more power? What do you want to do from here going forward to rule properly over my people? God was talking to King Solomon. You know what King Solomon asked for? He says, God, listen, uh, listen, I don't know anything else but to ask you, but for wisdom. Yes, wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge times experience, and that is wisdom. So King Psalm said those things to God. And God says, whoa, what an answer. And in response, with a great smile, God says, I'll not only give you wisdom, but everything you didn't ask for. So when you go about decisions, ask yourself, am I asking from wise people? And who am I paying attention to when it comes to making a crucial decision in your life? And here's the worst part. Lots of times people think I make the decision when I'm high or low. Never make a decision when you're down, because that's your fear talking to you. But when you're down, guess what you listen to? The words of the wise, the actions and the behaviors of the wise, not the hasty. And by the way, what our country is about to go through right now, with the increase of interest rates, with inflation this high, a lot of people are looking to other sources and many different sources. They're looking, why? Because fear sharpens listening. But make sure when you are listening, you make sure you listen to people that have been there, done that, there's a lot of people that have never experienced a major recession. The last 12 years, a country has never experienced a major recession. Yes, the pandemic, there was a flash recession. It was in March or April 2020. But a lot of people in the last 12 years, a lot of people in the financial sectors, a lot of people in many different sectors, they've never experienced a major downturn or major correction in the marketplace. And a lot of people are about to be exposed. So if I were you right now, I'd be asking a lot of people, hey, what did you do during early 2000 or dot-com bubble recession? What did you do during the 08, 09 Great Recession? What did you do? What did you do? What worked? What didn't work? I'd be going around right now asking questions of those people that experienced those tough financial times. All right, do not oppress those that are less fortunate. You got some success, you got some cash, you got some credit, you got some promotion. What should you do with those blessings? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 16 and 22 and 23 read like this. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. 22, 23 reads like this. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. Now, does it say in the meantime, you can't get rich because you oppress the poor? Of course you can. But guess who's got their back? God has got their back. It's a value. It's a principle. It's a moral. So therefore, you need to help those who are less fortunate not oppress them. 
Not beat your chest, say, hey man, I'm King Kong in this position. Not look down upon people because you drive in this car, or you live in this house, or have your kids in this school. You should help other people who are less fortunate with wisdom, knowledge, and obviously with your financial resources. Next one, who to not make friends with. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 and 25, read like this. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with the fierce man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. How many times has somebody successful, somebody that's considered a captain, somebody that's considered a leader, goes about life and they're angry all the time? Not saying they can't get angry, but they're always angry, always angry, always angry, always pissed, always pissed, always pissed. And I'm saying that they're not intense, I'm not saying that they hold high standards, but they're angry. There's something angry about them. They're always mad. But somehow, some way in business, they succeed. They do some things, they get money, they get a promotion. King Solomon says, don't go make friends with them. You be careful with them because they're going to set you up for the worst part decisions of your life. And here's the thing, sometimes you don't know. That's why these things take time. These take time for you to get to know somebody to build a relationship with somebody, to see what they do, not during the best of times, but in the worst of times. And speaking of that, who do you agree to do business with? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 26. Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those who is surety for debt. If you had nothing with which to pay, why should he take away from your bed from under you? Helping somebody who's in a bad financial situation and co-signing a loan, co-signing a student loan, co-signing a mortgage, co-signing a car loan, all these different things, if the other person does not have the ability to pay, it's a sign of an emotional blackmail type of situation. Listen, we talked about prudence, right? We talked about prudence. King Solomon talks about prudence, and prudence is very biblical. It's very faith-based. Identifying when the person cannot pay back, but yet you promise to pay this debt, this loan, even though the person you're co-signing with cannot pay, it's a bad sign. So in other words, if you're co-signing with somebody that you know down the road will have a difficulty in paying, you should be able to say, you know what? I'm not gonna let this financial situation be held over your head. I have to be prepared to pay whatever debt you signed up for that I'm co-signing with to prepare that and pay that when you cannot. And guess what? There's gonna be a day in their life, dark day, away from you, and comes up and say, hey, old bell, you co-signed this loan with me. I need, you, I need you to help me out. So wait a minute, I'm here to help you out to raise your credit score. I'm here to help you buy your first property, invest in this real estate, to start this business. I co-signed this debt for you, and now you can't pay, now you're putting it on me? You're putting my family at risk now? You're taking bread off my table? Well, guess what? You obligated yourself to pay that. And how many times have we seen money divide people for the worst situations? King Solomon says, hey, be careful of the scenarios when somebody asks you to put money up, so therefore you can protect the relationship because there's not much power in the word yes. Yes is an expensive word. Yes means I'm paying. Yes means I'm obligated to do and follow through when I don't want to because you said the word yes. But there's also freedom in the word no. And even though right now, they may not like you, even though right now, they may not agree with your decision to co-sign with this loan or get in debt with them, even though you know potentially down the road they cannot afford to pay, it will save you grief from answering to your own wife your own husband, your own children, while you can't fund things that they want to do because you co-sign this person, you're going to avoid that argument altogether. So which would you rather do? Go down with a friend, go down with a buddy because they can't afford to pay, or you want to side with making sure you can provide for your own family. Which would you prefer? Which leads me to my next one. There's a power in diligence and being excellent in your work. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. What happens when you're diligent and powerful and skillful in your work? Verse 29 reads like this. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Notice here, it didn't say who the smartest man is. It didn't say here who the richest man is. It says a man here who is diligent and excellent in their work. Somehow, some way, this is what you gotta believe with your faith. This is where faith led and faith made kicks in. You gotta be able to say, you know what? I might have all the skills, I might have all the riches, but here's what I am, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna trust that God will cast a spotlight on my work, on my efforts, on my podcast, on my contribution to this company, on my ability to hire and fire the right people. God somehow, some way, is gonna cast a light on this, on this particular investment deal that I did, because I was prudent, I was diligent, I saw wisdom and counsel before making such a big decision with my money, my name and my reputation, my finances. God's going to shine a big spotlight upon you. 
And oftentimes, those that work in silent, those that are obscure, those that a lot of people don't know about, next thing you know, bam. And you can't hate on them because they're excellent and diligent in their work. My mentor often says this, you want to not only outwork people, but you want to be out improving people. You want to be out strategizing people. And then, last but not least, you then outlast people. And here's the cool part. For many of you, just like myself, who's not talented, who doesn't come from a rich family, doesn't have an inheritance to depend on, just go about your work being diligent. Go about your work being prudent. Go about your work being excellent in the small things. So therefore, if you are excellent in those small things, guess what? The big things then will come your way. And that's what it means to be a faith-made type of person, a faith-made millionaire, in my opinion. That being said, if you haven't checked out already, please check out these other episodes here on different Proverbs we unpack because we are dedicated to 52 weeks of unpacking one proverb a week. And we're already in chapter 22. And next week will be chapter 23. Please post your comments, your thoughts, your feedback. You agree with me? You don't agree with me? Please let me know. Put it in the comment section below. If you found value in this video, please consider hitting like. And if you watched a couple of our videos already and you haven't done so already, please consider hitting subscribe. And if you're looking for Seven Figure Squad merchandise, please look at sevenfiguresquad.com. I appreciate you tuning in. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Thank <laughs> you.